This is Breaking Down Security, and I am Brian Brake. Welcome back, listener. This is Brian, Mr. Betcher, and of course, as always, Miss Berlin for Breaking Down Security. Hello. Hey, guys. Here, so he, Mr. Betcher, he was a bit tie tie. He had a long, hard day, so he just got up from a nap just before the podcast. So, <laughs> thankfully, his wife, who cares more about the podcast than he does, woke him up and goes, I know. Hey, you have a podcast? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, it's good. Tell, tell Mrs. Betcher that uh, I thank her for, you know, having her priorities straight. So. Right. Nice. <laughs> I'll yeah. tell her. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to stab me. I can <laughs> so. All right. Well, so, um, Mr. Betcher, you are uh, you live in the Austin area, so you're okay. You didn't have any of the, the Harvey stuff going on, did you? No, we didn't have any tornadoes close to us, thankfully. Had a lot of flooding around the area. Mm. But, uh, yeah, just heavy winds and a lot of rain. Yeah. Um, I put out a five-gallon bucket the day before. Um, just... I don't know. I was cleaning up stuff and I just set it aside. And then the next day I went out and it was full. Oh my God. So we got a lot of water. Well, they they did say what it was something, some kind of hundreds of trillions of gallons of water landed in Houston. So um, that's still not over with uh, as of the 28th, which is when we're recording this. It's it's there's like sharks falling from the sky and stuff. Is that what it is? Really? Yeah. I've never seen any of those movies. So I don't, I don't know. Me neither. Oh, okay. So it's supposed to track up into the Mississippi River Valley there. So there may be some more flooding down uh, in New Orleans before it's over with. So that'll be an interesting thing to hear how the how everybody's planning for that. So um, yeah, when somebody told me they'd have twenty inches of rain, which was an understatement, by the way, yep. in hindsight. Yep. But they said twenty inches, and I was like, "Ooh, that's going to be devastating for Houston." Yeah, and actually, they had and fifty. So. Yeah. Some places are going to have locally 50 inches of rain, which is a year's worth of rain in like a week. So that's, yeah, that's it, God awful. It's so flat there. If they get a lot of rain, then the streets are going to flood. Oh, yeah. So I was like, those people better get out. Yep. Yep. So got to practice your DR there, your disaster recovery. So yeah, it's pretty, yep. pretty bad, but yeah, if, uh, if you are in the Houston area, we, uh, we're, we're definitely thinking of you and hope that uh, you can get back on your feet and you're, you know, haven't lost anything of value. So, but yeah. I like Houston. I like Houston drivers because, yeah, they're rude. <laughs> you know, like city drivers are rude, but they're fast. So it's like yes. you don't mind, right? <laughs> because you're going like seventy five in a in a sixty. Have you, you ever driven in Ohio? Like, is it the opposite? No, I've never driven in Ohio. Why is it like they're really everyone and goes slow? like twenty miles under the speed limit? <laughs> Look, we, we wow. only have like five listeners. Please let's not alienate everybody in this in the state of Ohio and and <laughs> no, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and the, like half of them are Amish, so you have to worry about that. <laughs> you can you can, <laughs> you can send your hate mail to Amanda <laughs> Berlin at gmail.com or whatever. <laughs> oh god <laughs> trying to Got lots of tractors oh well, we we did tractors in missouri that uh we had a lot of uh i don't mind the tractors though oh okay. they're supposed to go slow yeah and so are the amish <laughs> people but all of the the rest of them can go drive away. faster drive. So. there you go it's, it's, there. Let's call it, that. <laughs> it took me a minute to come yeah. up with something but. yeah <clears throat> so um Miss Berlin, you're still setting, settling into your new job, and I, I hear am. they're recruiting. Yeah, it's going really well. Are they recruiting? I hear they're openly recruiting. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I guess one of the listeners, they didn't tell me who, uh, heard about it and sent in a resume. So I guess we're passively and actively recruiting for things. Wow. I, I don't know exactly what roles, but, I mean, if you're looking for a job, just send it in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. Yeah. I guess just say that. You know of me. I mean, you can say that you know me too. Yeah, I yeah. I wouldn't know. There you but. go, Mr. Betcher. Have you seen anything interesting uh, in in your neighborhood, uh, infosec wise, in the last week or so? 
Oh, I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot in Austin. I haven't been paying attention, but there's, there's over, according to LinkedIn, there's 40,000 job openings in Austin. Are they all in development though? Don't know. Okay. I, I guess everything, but 40,000 is a huge number. Yeah. So. Isn't it like hot singles near you, but it's infosec jobs in Houston? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. That would be <laughs> that would... not really that many there. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it look like you can make, you know, 200,000. Yeah. You know, we need to have a recruiter on because uh, I think, I think I got the worst job suggestion ever a couple of weeks ago i actually got pimped for a nurse job what and i was like oh it must be like they must be like joking right no it was for a nurse job to like clean bedpans take bp everything and i'm like what wow what makes you think that i have a bachelor's of science in nursing degree and 10 years of experience in nursing that I need to have this sent to me. And I, I publicly put it out on Twitter. I was like, hey, you guys are the worst recruiting company ever. <laughs> you deserve to Naturally, not be weather observers translates to a good nurse. Obviously. Yes. No. Uh, yeah. I've gotten I've gotten train engineers before. Oh. Like well, that's not so bad. I guess one engineer is the same as the next. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like I can totally drive it. I mean, they only go straight. Yeah. <laughs> I, I worked in a hospital like for three months when I got out of high school and I worked in the food service area. I can't, I must, I, I can't handle bodily fluids. I, I'm a sympathetic puker. I can't do anything. No. Yeah. You wouldn't do good as a nurse then. No, of course not. So yeah, it's, it's worse. We, we need to get a recruiter on to talk about, that i think it's a good idea having you know companies understand job descriptions and helping recruiters write better job descriptions and you know where the buck stops is it would be helpful in understanding that so well uh <clears throat> right after i got my computer science degree i got offered a job as data entry you know to transfer paper stuff to computer stuff you mean like medical right? transcriptionists or something like that I, well, it's it's basically you use your one hand on the number keypad. Oh, ten key. And you just sit there and you enter those those damn numbers all day. Oh yeah. And you they don't... measure you like how many buttons you push per minute, stuff like oh, that. I used to be so good wow. at that because I was a cashier at a tractor supply store. I love and like I we, we didn't have scanners, so we had to type in all the numbers. I love my keyboard with the ten <gasps> key on the side. I yes, love this. This is the, the best, best Apple keyboard, and it's not it's oh. not a it's an un, un, it's a it's a wired keyboard for Apple, but I love it because it's got the ten key on it. Because when yes. I'm typing in IP addresses, yeah, I love that stuff. I don't buy keyboards without the ten key, right? Yeah, yeah. It's well, hard my to, yeah, the Mac a, doesn't come with one. Nope. This is That's a seven dollar like keyboard, and I love these, man. Yeah. I have a wireless keyboard that doesn't have the ten key on it, and I. It's probably over there shoved in the shoved in the yeah, there it is over there. Yeah, but it doesn't have one and it bogs, bo bothers me because I have to use the home. Okay, remote. now that we just wasted 10 minutes without talking about security stuff, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. We will seg out of this. So, um, last week, um, last week being Tuesday, uh, uh, or Thursday of last week, I went to the NCC group open forums. Uh, saw Sarah K. Squire. She's at Sarah K. Squire on, on Twitter if you want to ask her about NIST guidelines. Uh, she was helping to um, work on the authentication stuff, authentication mechanisms. So she came out with the new guidance that they they figured out. Um, what was interesting, she said that they did those over GitHub instead of doing like the typical RFC where you send it out to people on mailing lists and then you wait for people to come back with feedback and then you send out yet another fix or whatever. So she said she actually, or her and the working group actually convinced NIST to do it on GitHub so that it would be almost instantaneous and the feedback would be, you know, more, you know, useful. And, and she said, oh, so wow. they had number of long lengthy conversations with people and pseudo experts and experts and, you know, Uber experts about these things. And, um, you know, it was almost instantaneous. So the communication was definitely better on GitHub than doing it like the typical RFC uh, do. 
So she said some of the things that came out of that was they're getting rid of security questions for password recovery. So, you know, when you go to recover your password, they recommend they're not they're recommending that you don't have a recovery password like how many dogs do I own or, you know, what's your father's maiden name or uh, I'm sorry, mother, mother's maiden. I did that again. Uh, mother's maiden name, um, you know, or, you know, things that are, are open OSINT type stuff that can be found. So um, they're they're wanting to get rid of that in favor. And also the SMS two-factor, but we already knew about that one. So there's a bunch of stuff coming on. I actually wanted her to come on after after uh, DerbyCon. So we were, we're, we're working on all the way out to like mid-October now for ideas for, for podcasts, for, uh, for things. So we're going to have Mick Douglas on hopefully after DerbyCon with his talk uh, and, and her to talk about uh, the, the new NIST requirements. So... Um, <clears throat> getting ready for DerbyCon. That's going to be fun. We talked about that before the show, of course. Uh, we're going to be ready. there. We're going to be doing some kind of meetup, I'm sure, so that we can, uh, you know, meet our fans. And uh, and if you're coming to DerbyCon, please uh, please introduce yourselves to us. Uh, and and Mr. Betcher, uh, of course. Some of us don't bite. Some of us don't bite, right? I've got all. So my I've shots. started a DerbyCon list right now. Things I need to do at DerbyCon, and I just added something here. What was it? Well, <laughs> you can't announce it on the podcast because it has to do with someone else. Oh. Uh, something that happened to someone else. And so I can't publicize it, but but that person will be at DerbyCon, and maybe we could nudge him to tell the story. Oh, you are vague booking the hell out wow. of this. Wow. Yeah. I, oh I, I don't want to get in trouble. Vague tweeting. So is this person we talked about before the show? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, my God. He's vague. Tweeting. <laughs> he's vague. He's vague talking even to me. Goodness. Talk about vague casting here. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing baked goods and lots of lots of booze. That's right. You're doing the Hawaiian shave dice, aren't you? Oh, that too. Yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm bringing like four gallons of moonshine and uh i'm doing shaved ice very nice because i bought a shaved ice machine oh, like a hawaiian shaved ice machine and i usually bake something very cool uh, where are, do you have a, a room at the hyatt or what how are you going <laughs> to store all this stuff i'm sure i know somebody that has a room at the hyatt where i can store stuff you're going to store okay. alcohol in somebody else's room and hope that it i've had get people store alcohol it. in my room hopefully <laughs> they'll return the favor uh, adrian okay. said i can keep keep ice in his room so I'm, okay. i'll probably just leave everything else in his room too right on okay <clears throat> all right so we do actually have to have a podcast here folks we so, do not talking um, about i wanted to talk about something stuff. that i've been doing at work uh i don't know if it's talk worthy probably isn't um but after seeing some of the talks that i saw at defcon uh, on on iron geek i probably could do a talk on this but so there's Different kinds of OSINT out there. You know, most people do OSINT on people to, or business to find out how their inner workings are. But um, I have been having to do a lot of uh, vulnerability OSINT because um, some of the vulnerabilities that I've got, and I'm going to call out Java in particular, uh, there's not a lot of information when a Java vulnerability comes out. You go to Oracle's website and you look at the Oracle vulnerability page for their CPU, which is their um, critical patch updates that comes out quarterly. Uh, and it, they give you a long list of vulnerabilities, CVSS scores, whether or not the remote and all that stuff. But that doesn't often work for the people that I work with who are very technical and they want to know, uh, you know, what part of this Java subsystem is affected by this or, you know, what, what, you know, what specifically in Nginx or what, if, you know, specifically in, um, you know, I don't know, uh, Hadoop. Hadoop is a thing. Um, we don't. I don't know if we use it or not, but that's that's something that just popped in my head. They want to know more particular information about that. And if you go to some of these websites, sometimes you'll find that the the people who make them is, and, and I, I I'm calling out Oracle specifically because there's almost no information about the vulnerability specifically in there. So I've had to be doing a lot of additional. Uh, research on those and the good thing that i've found at least for java is that uh, some of the os's that are out there go into far more detail on their security pages than just what you find on oracle's website um, so we use a lot of ubuntu in my office 
uh, and I go to Ubuntu site and they, they give you a little bit of information, but if you go to the more technical Linuxes, uh, like Arch or, uh, SUSE or, um, I don't know, scientific Linux or those, you'll often find that they will publish additional information, uh, above and beyond what you'll find on Oracle site. Um, there's a, there's some links in our show notes uh, to to various websites that have various bits that you know go into the into that detail. But um, so I, I will put it to 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 Mr. Betcher and, and Ms. Berlin. But how do you guys handle dealing with vulnerabilities in your environments or in your past environments? Well, um, I always I, I had the same problem you do sometimes. And you'll, you'll go to us, uh, the company website that has the vulnerability, and they want to be so obscure about it, like, oh, it's, it's not really our fault. But if you, you know, if you get some idiot who kind of uses it improperly and, and does these stupid things, you might get the case where sometimes one in a million shot that you might have our program just, uh, you know, kind of steal all your data. Yeah, or something like that. <laughs> yeah. and it's like what? <laughs> oh, it's so awful. And then you go to some other site, and they mm-hmm. they explain it um, in in such a way where, oh uh, yeah, you know that makes perfect sense, right? And and uh, it's not so obscure and things like that. So yeah, uh, finding finding those is difficult because it's not always the same site that that gives the good explanation. Yeah, that's right. You got to be a Google master or something right. to be able to find. Uh, a site that actually explains it and you know does it really affect me am i uh, can i mitigate it in some way that's not going to be so disruptive as mm-hmm. to you know reboot my you know databases or, or something like that and yep. yeah it's it's a challenge and i know exactly where you're coming from man so here, here's my problem it's is it my, the reason I have to go look at these things is because I have people in my organization who want that information. Uh, short of having to actually buy an Oracle product to get the insider information, uh, this is this is what I've been reduced to basically. Which is it's not bad. I mean, this is a good exercise if you're if you're wanting to learn about you know you know googling and, and understanding these things. But is it is it necessary for us to have to go into that? Is it just a failing on our part to go okay? CVSS says it's remote. Uh, it's network, so it's 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 a remote network vulnerability. There's no auth required. That should be enough. Is is it a failing on our part by not being able to explain that to the people who are there, or are they doing what they're wanting additional information for as a stalling tactic for not fixing an issue? I don't know if it's a stalling tactic so much as a you know yeah it's it's not our fault and it's not that bad, yeah. right? They, they try to minimize the, the problem usually. Um, and and it, it's just clever wording. Yeah. And the less right? information they release, the probably the, the, I'd imagine uh, the less likely of a proof of concept to come out. Yeah. Well, my, my thing is the more information I have, the more information I can then go to formulate a solution. But if I don't have any information, like let's put it for instance, so the, the 2017 10,102, if you go to, you know, Ubuntu site, which basically copy and pasted the Java vulnerability stuff from the CPU site, it says vulnerability in Java SE, SE embedded component, da, 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 da. So it runs off a bunch of stuff, different versions, difficult to exploit vulnerability allows unauthenticated attacker with network access via multiple protocols to compromise Java SE, SE embedded. While the Java, while the vulnerability is in there, attacks may significantly impact additional products. There, it doesn't really tell me anything other than that it's base score of nine. Uh, you know, it's network. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, the CIA triad is all high. You know, the scope has changed, you know, so there, it, other than CVSS vector and the fact that it may affect, you know, the vulnerabilities and unauthenticated attacker via network access, you don't get a lot of information there, which is, is no way of saying, okay, how do we mitigate this vulnerability? You know, one, we, we may or may not use Java, you know, uh, a lot of the vulnerabilities that I found, at least on the, um, 
um, the Oracle website, uh, they do break it down by whether or not it's server side or whether it's client side. And that does make a difference. If you don't use uh, an application that requires Java applets or Java web start, some of those don't actually affect you, which is great. And that's, that's, that's a good thing to know. If all of the Java that you're doing is server side, it's an entirely different vulnerability than it would be if you were using a Java applet, which is great. But if you go to Arch website, that same vulnerability says it was discovered that the DCG or distributed garbage collector implementation in the RMI component of OpenJDK, and that's that's the other thing that I found, uh, failed to correctly handle references. A remote attacker could use this flaw to execute arbitrary code with privileges of the RMI registry or Java RMI application. So I have stopped using Oracle's website in that respect when I'm looking for Java vulnerabilities and instead go to OpenJDK, which shares a lot of the same uh, code base as regular Java. Uh, and it also then shares a lot of the same vulnerabilities. Um, I'm sure that there are um, repackaged, you know, uh, Apache versions out there or go ahead. So where, where are they getting the information I mean, Oracle put it out. I mean, they they are the ones that probably discovered it and know the most about the vulnerability. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So where are these well, other places be, magically getting more information? It like, would I don't have really to know be how that from, works. from somebody. It'd have to be from someone else other than Oracle. Because if Oracle found it themselves, they would never publish it. Well, I mean... right. As far as I know, I don't know if how OpenJDK works, but I, I, I assume OpenJDK is very similar to how CentOS and Red Hat work. CentOS uh, follows Red Hat, you know, and in, in the development cycle. So when you know Red Hat Seven comes out, CentOS Seven comes out, and they all use a lot of the same open source libraries. The only difference is you pay for Red Hat, you don't pay for CentOS. So if people don't want to spend a lot of money, you know, putting their enterprise up with Red Hat, they can always use CentOS. So it would follow that the vulnerabilities that affect Red Hat, and if you get no good information on on Red Hat, you may be able to go over to CentOS and look at commit logs or or get to look at uh, uh, other vulnerabilities that come on CentOS's page and go, okay, like we found here on Arch Linux's page, all this additional information that we did not get from Ubuntu or, uh, you know, uh, Red Hat or what have you. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's what I've had to, you know, be doing. I mean, and, and of course, you know, I give this to them and say, okay, are we using RMI? And that's that's the other thing is there's so many, you know, some of these applications are so complicated, you don't even know what you're using under the hood. So it's helpful to know, especially for things like Java or, you know, for Nginx, what, you know, mods you're using or what PHP mods that you're using that uh, you know when you're going into that. Because if we're not using RMI, which is, um, has something, it's some kind of subcomponent of Java, but it's also a subcomponent of JDK. If you're not using that, then that doesn't affect you. So that's great. So, um, yeah, I don't know what RMI is. I'm sure somebody out there is yelling at what it is. Remote method invocation. There you go. Uh, okay. This vulnerability, it says at the Oracle site, this vulnerability can only be exploited by supplying data to APIs in the specified component without using untrusted, so let's get like kind of a double negative, without using untrusted Java web start applications or untrusted Java applets, such as through a web service. Mm -hmm. So basically it's really, really bad. Yeah, but how is it really, really bad? Now you read that and and you know some people go, okay, well if you don't use Java web start applets, then you're not vulnerable to this. You know, this is a this is a, a client side vulnerability, which, to be fair, a lot of Java vulnerabilities are. Um, so, if you're not using Java, you know, on say your website, you know, to be able to start up a Java web applet or something like that, then these probably don't don't affect you. But you need to know that information, and if you can't get that from one vendor or one OS security page, maybe you can find that by visiting another one. So you shouldn't limit yourself to your OS's yeah. security page. And there, and there, you know, there's a myriad of other places. I actually tried uh, the Java Reddit, <laughs> which I realized was stupid in hindsight because it was just a bunch of Java developers that didn't care anyway. And all they thought was I was looking for, you know, ways of exploiting these things. Um, you can actually go over to the Java Reddit and look up my uh, my handle Breakbee and uh, and see the. <laughs> they were like, "Oh, nice try, 
evil hacker dude. And I'm like, are you <laughs> kidding me? 18 year old. Just tell me what I need to know. How are you doing this? And then I realized, well, they're not a security people. They're, they're, they're developer people. So they don't, they don't really care. So, but there's a lack of, I mean, unless you pay the money to get the Oracle insider, which requires you to almost buy a product from them. Uh, I think that's probably the only other way you're going to get more detailed information and lacking that you have to go and, you know, do your due diligence on the Google edge. So, so that's some of the things I've been, uh, I've been working on it at work, you know, having to deal with, uh, you know, that the other thing I found interesting during my, uh, my travels looking for this specific CVE was a website that will, uh, that, that basically rates what different vulnerabilities cost. If you can find a uh, working POC for it. So like the, the, the 2017, 10,102 vulnerability on this voldb.com is worth five to $25,000 us. If you can find a vulnerability for it, cause I guess it's, it's remote. So if you can find a POC for it, then it's, you know, it's good to go. So, um, so yeah, that was, uh, that, that's what I've been working on. Um, so, uh, let me see, what do we have on our thing? Uh, the DerbyCon CTF walkthrough. Okay. So a lot of people have asked about this. Uh, so we have everybody here except Tyler. I should have asked Tyler if he wanted to be here, but I haven't seen him on Slack the last few days. Uh, you can sign up for that at breaksec.signup.team if you want to join our Slack. So, um, so let's get started. Um, Ms. Berlin, you did you did stage one of our uh, our CTF. I did. It was so much fun. Yeah. How did you yeah. uh, How did you do that? And tell me. Tell so, us some of the pitfalls you had trying to make that work. So I can't remember if I've talked about this here or not before. But did I did I talk about like the inspiration of what made me think of doing the OSINT one? Uh, I think we talked about it like on a pre-show, but it never actually made it okay. on the show. All right. So yeah, I um. I had taken uh, uh, Chris Hadnagy's course on social engineering um, and OSINT at DerbyCon th- three years ago, I think. Okay. I don't know. They all kind of run together. Um, and at the end of his class, he had um, like, I don't know, it's like almost the entire last day was an OSINT CTF yeah. and I'm not going to give away like all of it, but you basically have to go out and find all this stuff on the internet, but it lasts all day, mm-hmm. um, which probably took him and a very large team of people a long time to create because mm-hmm. there was a whole lot of information compared to what mine was. Really? So that's kind of the idea behind mine. Cause I had always wanted to create something kind of sort of like that. Okay. So, uh, I came up with Big Bob's Chemistry Lab and uh, registered a domain for it, created a uh, a blog a blogspot site for it. Um, and uh, while I was driving down uh, to Disney with my family, um, I had my mom like take notes take notes for me, and I came up with like pretend people. Mm-hmm. So this CTF only ended up having three of the six that I came up with because I didn't need that many. Yeah. Um, but I created them all Google email addresses, which looking back, I should have just created like a fake, you know, like one of the, the short term email addresses because I only needed it for, you know, a short amount of time. Yeah. Um, but with those email addresses, I used it to create Facebook accounts, LinkedIn accounts, um, at least at least two different forum accounts um, on a, on a car forum Mm -hmm. for one of the people. Um, I use it to register the domain. Uh, What else? I uh, I tried to do some Instagram, but that got shut down. So yeah, it took a a long time to create all of these fake profiles on the internet. Um, Turns out that Facebook's AI is pretty advanced and shut down all of the Facebook accounts. <laughs> it shut them all down. <laughs> yeah. Now, wait, I uh, only heard that it shut down like two of the three. It actually ended up shutting all of yeah, them Yeah, it shut down the other one a couple of days later. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so I didn't end up using any of the Facebook stuff. Uh, the old guy, Frank, uh-huh. that was the... He was a janitor for Big Bob's Chemistry Lab who was in a secret relationship with one of their chemical engineers. I think she was a chemical engineer, something okay. like that. All right. Um, 
So he was not very technologically savvy and used his LinkedIn kind of like Facebook. Oh, okay. (laughs) Because it never happens in real life. Wrote her poems and posts about how much he loved her on LinkedIn. Um, And one of the flags was in one of the poems. Okay. Um, (laughs) So people, they did a good job finding that one. Very nice. Um, uh, The girl that he was in love with was illegally selling narcotics from the chemistry lab out of the trunk of her uh, Volkswagen, maybe. I don't remember the plot anymore. But out of the trunk of one of her cars, which um, she was advertising via her profile on the forum. Okay. Okay. So she had signed up for the car forum and was posting on there with the same user account that she, I I consistently use the same user account for LinkedIn, for the email, for the forums, whatever. Yeah. So they'd be easier to find. Um, But yeah, on on her profile, it it listed a paste bin bin link Mm -hmm. and the list of narcotics she was selling out of the trunk of her car was in the paste bin link. Uh, and there was a flag in, in that paste bin, bin link as well. Okay. Now how would people have found uh, the, the various people uh, on, on Google? Was the SEO good enough that all they had to do was put in big Bob's chemical lab and they would have found the janitor and they would have found. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Google just picked it up. I mean, cause it's a blog. It was a blog spot. Oh, um, right. Right. Blog. So yeah. all you had to do is search for the name and it would come up. Okay. Um, and the fact that they registered as working there on LinkedIn. Right. Showed up in Google. Wowzers. That was quick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I like added, I added fake stuff to their Google plus pages and, uh, that's what I was trying to do on Facebook. I was going to try and create a whole bunch of fake stuff on Facebook. Right. Um, okay. yeah. So it was, <laughs> awesome. it was interesting. So yeah. we ended up with what, about 20 people who got to that? I think. Yeah. 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 There's a good amount of people that got it. Yeah. So uh, the second one was Mr. Betcher. You did, you did stage two, didn't you? Yes. What was your, what was your uh, stage all about? My stage was about, well, I wrote this, um, this little story and basically it was your, your first week on the job or whatever. And, um, there was this problem at work. Okay, so Mm -hmm. one of your orientation buddies from work wrote you an email that said, hey, I kind of noticed this and you're a security dude, so maybe you know what's going on. Uh, Nobody believes me, but kind of, uh, why don't you take a look at this? Okay. And so what it was is you had to recognize that this was a big problem. And the email uh, has a log entry from one of their uh, application servers and basically you figure out that the company got hacked in some way mm-hmm. um, the company believes that it was instability but then you can verify by the log entry that this was indeed some sort of a breach where somebody uh, entered the database um, without proper credentials uh, admin account Okay. So the log entry has a SQL injection flaw in it or, a, or an attack that you had to recognize. And if you got the attack, then you were able to answer the question. The question was, what does this hash in the, um, in the log entry mean? Or w- what exactly is the value that is hashed to that entry? Mm-hmm. And so the flaw was um, basically you can tell that it, it, that it is a, um, uh, you know, username and password entry and that you type admin and mm-hmm. then the password for the admin account. And so basically it says it, it enters in admin and false two plus two equals five, which is false. So the whole first part of the statement is false and that's union to, uh, a select statement, which has the pass, uh, the username as admin and the password is injected as whatever password this um, uh, hash is. Okay. 
So, yep, that's it. If you recognize that, that it was SQL injection and what it was doing, you, you would know that the hash represented the password that was entered in the SQL injection. Yeah. Or you could just decompile all that hash and find out what that is, too, if, you, if you've got Hashcat and you wanted to try and figure that out as well. Yeah, and I think that... The, that what, was another way to do it. Yeah, and that's what I think everybody ended up doing. They, they took the hash and... Uh, and you know, got the password from that because that was how they got to mine. So stage three was me, which I, I may have phoned it in a little bit, but I really like me some Sudoku puzzles. So I was like, well, let's do a hexadecimal Sudoku puzzle. So what I did was I, I got up in there and I found a fairly decent randomizer, which I did not realize at the time that when somebody solved it, they said, oh, yeah, there's Sudoku solvers online. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I did not realize this. Hey, so. yeah, hacker. Yeah, well, uh, I, I made it difficult, or at least I thought I did. Uh, there are um, so what what I didn't tell people was there was an Easter egg inside that if you could not solve the the puzzle, uh, if you'd looked in the EXIF data on the the Sudoku, I had actually put uh, row three of the Sudoku inside the, the the metadata. So if you had gone in and looked at the the in, in the EXIF, it would have had you. I w- I solved twenty five percent of it for them just in case. I actually did not know there were Sudoku solvers online because I actually solve them the hard way by logic and you know not cheating. You're so old school, man. There's cheaters for everything. Cheater Cheater McCheaterson's out there, you know, but. So, um, yeah, that, uh, everything, everything's fair game in a CTF though. I, yep. that is, that is a true statement. I mean, you know, if you could find something to help you solve it, that's great. So, uh, once you got the code, which was 16, it was a hexadecimal bit, uh, of 16 characters. The, the final section was, uh, created by Tyler. And what he did was it was a video file that he added some captioning to. And uh, if you were playing the CTF, the uh, the theme song was th- from Three's Company. And if you wa- watched the whole video, you noticed that there was a message in uh, a trinary format. It was a, th- uh, what was it? What is it called? Base, ten- base three. It was in base three. So it was all zero, ones, and twos. So if you pulled the whole message out and then used the same kind of uh, method by which you solve base 10 or base eight or base six, you get a secret message that said, I always liked, um, what was her name? Damn. I, it was one of the ladies. I think it was, uh, uh, Susan, uh, Suzanne Summers's character on, uh, uh, I always liked, come on, just give me the break. Sec podcast Gmail. Okay. So the exact message was, I always liked. Anyway, so so keep talking and I'll find it. <laughs> Shut your faces. We're, we're waiting in suspense. Shut your whole faces. Uh, are you killing me? Uh, okay, so I always preferred Chrissy. That's what it was. So. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So the, the I, I mean, I actually did. I actually I actually liked Chrissy as well. Um, anyway, uh, I never actually watched it except in reruns of reruns. So, but um, so I, I I put this out at like eight a.m. Pacific time as I was getting on a ferry to go to Victoria, British Columbia, and I thought because like the last time we did it, oh yeah, this will take hours and I don't have to worry about it or whatever. I'm sitting there waiting to get on the ferry, and I get the first email. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> wow. All right. Well, solved in less than an hour by um, uh, she goes by at C sex. She lady on. Yeah. Uh, on Twitter. So she solved that uh, fairly quickly. So say that, say that five times fast. Yeah, I will not. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't do my tongue and me don't uh, don't sec do she good. lady solved. Yes, yeah, sec underscore she underscore lady. Uh, she oh she's a malware. Oh she does malware and reverse engineering enthusiast. Yeah, she's a tabletop. I met her at DEF CON this year. Oh, you did? I did. Oh, she's a nice lady then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so she's a malware reverse engineering enthusiast. Interesting. 
Okay, so it's interesting because we're actually trying to find somebody who can teach us like an intro to reverse engineering course. So maybe I will ask her and see if she wants to do that. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was the the walkthrough that we had uh, for that. Uh, to be honest, I probably could have done a little more on mine, um, but I was going through Sec five hundred four at the time. I, that's not an excuse, but I just you know. But it is. You know what I? I will have to to step up my game too. I I thought it would be a little bit harder than what it was, but I've got some ideas for next year, and it, it'll be much harder. Well, you know, to be fair, uh, for the real CTFs out there, like what DerbyCon and DefCon and them are doing, they're already working on next year's right now because yeah. it takes time to set all that stuff up. So, oh yeah, it's a big, it's a big uh, job. Yeah, I thought about maybe doing something on uh, doing like a vulnerable container, and actually, um, I'm going to put this link in the show notes. But uh, literally two days after the end of our CTF, I found this uh, website called uh, it's a GitHub site, but it's called SecGen. And what it does is it allows you to create vulnerable VMs on the fly. What? I know. Um, so let me let me find that link. And I'm definitely going to put that in the show notes because I found that very interesting. And there's also one that I found that um, uh, they're also doing vulnerable dockers right now, vulnerable docker VMs. So I thought about maybe uh, setting something up for that as well. So, um, yeah, so that'll be in the show notes. But so, yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, uh, you know, I'm looking for somebody who can do an intro to RE class for us, a one to 200 level type intro course where you're basically learning how to do assembly, you know, how understanding assembly, writing shell code, that kind of thing, uh, for the idea that, you know, we, we move on to more advanced stuff. I mean, you know, not sans level stuff, obviously, but you know, if you're wanting to learn how to run, you know, a debugger, uh, use an Ollie debug OSCP like stuff, which is one of the reasons I wanted to start these classes anyway, was to get better at learning about OSCP so I can one day maybe get mine. Um, so if you do uh, reverse engineering or you just want to teach somebody something, you know, it is a paying gig. Uh, we did uh, pay out for Mr. Uh, Mr. Douglas's class on PowerShell, which went crazy good. We had about 25 people in there. So, um, he enjoyed that immensely and he'll, he'll be on in a couple weeks, like I said, to talk about his uh, Derby con talk. So, you know, I think that's, uh, I think that's long enough show. Uh, we were, we had a few other things we wanted to talk about, but we can save those for another time. They're not going to, they'll keep. So they're like, <laughs> hang on like, break. Yeah. What's up? Polanski or crusher? You mean Dr. Pulaski? Yes. No, not Pulaski. Beverly Crusher forever, man. Trust me. <laughs> Tab dancing doctor. So for those of you who don't understand, Star Trek Next Generation. Uh, I have no four. idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Just Great. to put that out there. That's okay. My wife does. So in season four, Beverly uh, Gates McFadden was pregnant. So she went off the show and um, I forget what her name is, but uh, she played Dr. Pulaski. She was also on an episode of the original series. Uh, two episodes. Two episodes. Oh, two episodes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Two different characters, as a matter of fact. Yep. Yep. Um, what's her name? Uh, crap. I'll have to look it up. I'll find it. It's, it'll be in the show notes. Uh, uh, okay. So Pulaski in TOS or Crusher? Well, Crusher wasn't even in the original series, so Pulaski. No. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, she was she was she was on that. I guess that's why they brought her back, but in season four, so uh of the original I like the guy from Reading Rainbow. <sighs> His character was very good. Yes, Third of the Forge. Yeah. But he didn't wear the visor on Reading Rainbow. I know. Kind of no. Yeah, that, that was what was threw weird. me for a loop, man. I feel bad because I met him. I actually funded the uh, the Reading Rainbow Kickstarter that was going on that made like Brazilian dollars. And I, I paid enough to go and do like a meet and greet with them down in L.A. So we flew from Seattle down to L.A. Uh, we have some friends down there, so we saw them anyway. But it was like 85 degrees, and I was an idiot and wore pants and uh, a T-shirt. And by the time it was to go in and we you know sat around and watched them you know read and stuff in the YouTube studios down there, and we were all ready for our meet and greet pictures, I was so sweaty, and I sweated on LeVar Burton to the point where he didn't want to put his arm around me and he rubbed his arm on me so that he would get his my sweat off of him. 
So I That's felt That's great. I am it, I was so freaking embarrassed and I'm really embarrassed that I even told that story right now. I just, <laughs> I just felt so bad cuz I was like, "Oh my god, I was just sweating on Lamar Burton." Oh my god. I, I bet you he probably like uh famous people probably get that a lot, right? Oh god. Like sweaty imagine. people just on them all oh, the time. And, and at Star Trek conventions too. So you know. Yeah. Like, it's it's probably like every infosec con multiplied by ten, you know. With like all I get hugged the, by sweaty people all the time. I can't imagine. Yeah, yeah. So how they do it? I yeah. I, I would hope that that's I, I I don't you know he doesn't remember me in his memoirs or whatever. So there's this one time the super sweaty guy. Oh, God, you're killing me. <laughs> dripping all over me. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So, all right, let's uh, let's get out of here. Let's uh, let's finish this off, Miss um, Amanda. How do people get a hold of you if they wanted to discuss the CTF or uh, you know upcoming uh, attendances with you? I I need I need to say that too because I told you guys, but it wasn't we on will. air. We will. Don't worry. Okay. All right. Go ahead. How do they get a hold uh, of you? At Info Sister. I N F O S Y S T I R on okay. Twitter and Slack. Okay. So before the show, you told us about something that was really awesome. And, yes. Uh, so, I'm so excited. So okay, so this is going to happen over Thanksgiving. You're going to ditch your kids and go where? I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ditching my kids and proud of it because I'm leaving the United States for the first time in my life and going to New Zealand to speak at Besides Wellington. Awesome. Oh wait, you said the first time in your life. Have you gotten a passport? Yeah, I got one. I got oh. one like three years ago, and I've never used it. Really? Okay. Yeah. So you've never even been to Canada or Mexico? No, no. And Canada's wow. like an hour and a half away from me. Why not? What's wrong with you? I don't know. I just have never had the chance or... Okay. Well, you know what? Like, maybe maybe Leo will invite you up, and you can go to Sector besides Toronto. I do want to, but Toronto it's is a awesome. bad, bad timing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you're going to go to Wellington, New Zealand, and they're, oh, it's so awesome. Man, Wait. Wellington is fantastic. I've so been if there. If there's it's... any of our listeners in Wellington, well, in New Zealand or Australia or anywhere else that's going, yeah. How many that days? Would be great. Is, how many days is besides Wellington? It's two days, but I plan on being in New Zealand for seven. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. Oh man, you got to go down there. See if uh, you can get like a. Um, uh, um, I don't know if they do tours around Wellington, but I know that there's a lot of sets and scenes for the Hobbit and the Lord. There of the is Games. actually a whole Google map that. Uh, kind of lays out where all the different filmings are yep. and everything that yep. my friend sent me. There's a lot going um, on in the, uh, the South Island. Um, I went to where they did Edoras, where the horse Lords of Edoras were on Mount Sunday. Yeah. That was way out there, but it was so awesome. Trevor R was our tour guide for that. He was fantastic. So there's that, uh, the one lake that I've seen in pictures that is like the clearest lake in the world, mm -hmm. but you're not allowed to actually swim in it because it's sacred or whatever. Oh, wow. But it's, I mean, you can look at it, which is, I guess, is cool. Yeah, don't wash your pits in the sacred lake. I know. Yeah. I want to like jump in. Yeah. But, so yeah, we did it. We did a cruise, a two week cruise from uh, Sydney to to Auckland uh, and across the Tasman Sea. We did Melford, Doubtful, and Dusky Sound. Uh, did a bunch of wine tours. Did uh, Hobbiton. We got to go see Hobbiton, yes. and that was yes. between the the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movie. So they didn't have all the sets and everything. Now that like all the sets are still there on the on the sheep farm. Yeah. And they have the green dragon where you can go and have a drink at the tavern and stuff. So that'd be, that would be awesome if you can get down there and do that. Yes. That'd be fantastic. Hopefully. Yep. And then I remember Chad who took us on our, our trip in Auckland. That was, uh, that was, that was dangerous. He, we were in like a min little mini VW bus with eight people in it. And uh, we were, no Dunedin. If you ever get to Dunedin, it has the steepest street in the world. It's like oh. almost a 45 degree angle. It's like or <gasps> better than 45 degrees. It's real I want to bike down it. Probably not advisable. No. It's I in a residential area. <clears throat> I, I, I'll tell you the story on, after the show because it's it's fairly interesting <laughs> history of Dunedin. So. It's the New Zealand podcast yeah. now. Oh, so awesome. Yes. Yes. Go to New Zealand if you can. So, um, uh, Mr. Betcher, how would people get a hold of you if they wanted to discuss things that weren't about New Zealand or besides New Zealand, uh, uh, Wellington? Yeah, you can reach me on Twitter at Betcher Pwned. B O E T T C H E R P W N E D. Uh, IMF security, log MD, all that. You got as it. As well, Mr. Goff is your uh, your salesperson and mouth of the organization. So My toady. He toady. Yeah, your your head developer and CTO or whatever. 
So, all right. So you can find out the uh, the official Breaksec podcast is at Breaksec on Twitter. Uh, we're at I'm at Brian Break B R Y A N B R A K E. Uh, we have a Slack if you want to join us and talk about podcasts or just anything else in the world that's infosec related. And actually, we have a random channel so you can talk about other stuff that isn't that. Uh, I had to keep. That's the, where I'm usually at. I had to keep the Game of Thrones spoilers off of there last night. Oh my god. Oh dude, I watched it today. Shh, oh my god. Shh, 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 oh my god. X-nay no spoilers, but oh god. Xnay on the Euler space. So um, yeah, too soon. So uh, yeah, if you want to join us on there, um, we have a lot of people on there. We're talking about all kinds of stuff. We have a job board. We our book clubs starting up in uh, two days on the thirtieth. We're going to go through a book there. You can find out how to buy that and get that. It's an ebook if you want to do it an ebook or a dead tree. Uh, Breaksec.signup.team and our, our fancy bot will send you an email and allow you to connect. So. Uh, we're on iTunes. If you are on iTunes and you download it there, we would love some feedback uh, there to help us get some more visibility. Thank you so much to all of our patrons our, on our Patreon. We're, uh, you know, I don't have to pay out of pocket anymore to support the the show on Libsyn, um, which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, we we believe in the value for value value for value model. So if you find value in our show. Feel free to leave something in the tip jar, if you will, by going or to our I'll Patreon. Or I'll shake it out of you the next time I see you. <gasps> wow. Okay. So Ms. Berlin's in the protection racket, apparently. <laughs> I'm the muscle of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'll have you Well, know... she is a DEF CON goon, so I'll give her that. <laughs> that is true. I'll have you know I can do 10 push-ups. Me too. N- not without cheating, though. Right. I sometimes need to put my knees down, but, um, so, <sighs> all right, well, let's, let's be done with this. All right. So we're on SoundCloud. We're on, um, iTunes, Google play store, uh, tune in radio. We're on stitcher. Apparently the way they're doing stitcher now, uh, they're, they're changing the way the downloads work over there. So, um, if something changes on your interface, I apologize. Um, you can email us at bds.podcast at gmail.com. So Yeah. Uh, we're, we're happy you're here and listening. So uh, that was it for this week on Breaking Down Security. You have a great week. Be safe. Um, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.